Welcome back, cave dwellers, to our Trash to Treasure journey with the Acorn Electron. In the first episode, we stripped down the machine and got familiar with how it works. In today's episode, we'll perform some checks to make sure it's safe to try powering it on. And these are checks that would apply to just about any computer that's been in storage for a long time. We'll also get the scope out and learn a little bit more about the Electron specifically. And then the moment of truth, assuming all seems well, We'll power it on and see if we have any image on the screen. So let's begin with the power supply. The Electron's power supply is an AC adapter supplying 19 volts and 14 watts to the machine. Mains electricity in the UK is supplied at 230 volts in the AC form. So I would expect this to be a fairly simple adapter that just steps it down to 19 volts. It's then converted to a 5 volt DC current on the power board inside the Electron as we saw in part 1. These plugs inform us that they're built to BS415 safety standards. Now what does that mean? Well you'd like to think it would mean the inside of your plug doesn't look like this. Scorch marks and what looks like an aftermarket repair mean this plug may work but I wouldn't trust it not to burn my house down. BS415 was the safety standard at the time for electrical safety in the home. Bearing in mind this was the early 80s, it has been replaced numerous times by updated standards. Some people may consider this unnecessary meddling or political correctness gone mad. I consider it to be unsafe. And the easiest way to make sure you are working safely is to buy a new power supply with the CE mark. Anything with a CE mark has to meet the latest electrical safety standards. At least here in the UK, your country may be different. And so in the interest of our restoration today, I will test the existing power supplies. The second one looks to be in better condition than the first, and they'll be fully supervised while we perform a power on test. But anything further than that will use a replacement power supply which I've ordered, and I'll show that to you before the series is out. A quick test on the power supply with the multimeter then shows that it is giving us just over 20 volts. That's within the tolerances I would expect for a 19 volt power supply that isn't currently under load, so I'm happy to go ahead and test with that. And of course this being an alternating current, and we're in the UK, you can see the electrical current alternating or reversing direction 50 times per second, because here in the UK our AC current runs at 50 Hz. From the wall plug then, to the power board inside the Electron. A quick visual check reveals no bulging or leaking capacitors, although they do appear to be the originals, so replacement capacitors go on my list to ensure the longevity of this machine. So let's go ahead and put some power through this, and just test what outputs it's given to ensure that when we do plug it into the Electron system board, we're not risking damage in it. Everything seems to check out with our tests. The 5 volt DC current is passing through perfectly, as is the negative 5 volt current. There's also an 18 volt AC current, which is passed directly through to the rear expansion slot for any add ons that are plugged into the machine. And that checks out just fine, also running at just over 20 volts while not under load. Old capacitors aside, I'm happy enough to continue testing this Electron, so let's move on to the system board itself. And the first thing we're checking for here is continuity. That is to say, is there a clear, unbroken link between the main components on the board, or do we have open circuits which could stop the machine from working, or worse still cause damage to components? Most multimeters have a continuity test mode, and it emits a tone if continuity is present, so that's what we'll be using here. We'll first test that the ground circuit to key components is continuous, and then we'll try with the positive 5 volt circuit. Now all of this testing information is within the Electron Service Manual which is just a quick Google away, but in short here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for ground continuity on pins 1 and 21 of the CPU. Pin 14 on the ROM, 
16 on each of the four RAM modules. and pins 51 and 68 on the ULA. And as you can hear from those ever so slightly annoying beeps, they all checked out fine. So let's move on to the 5 volt circuit and I'll spare you the beeps this time. On this lap we're looking for continuity on pin 8 of the CPU, pin 28 of the ROM, pin 8 of each of the RAM modules, and pins 9, 43 and 48 of the ULA. And once again it all checked out fine. A simple check on the 18 volt circuit to the rear expansion port shows that that's passing through just fine. And of course a visual check of the capacitors on the board show that there are no leaks and bulges here, but yet again they are the original capacitors and in the long term I'll be replacing them before the series is out. But these tests have given me enough confidence that the correct amount of power will be flowing into the machine. The power will be reaching each of the components and they'll all be grounded correctly. And hopefully we have a fully operational board. So let's plug the power in and see what the components are doing. Now there's one other tool that I could use at this point which unfortunately I don't have yet. I am saving for it. And that's a desktop power supply that would allow me to slowly increase the voltage to the board. This would be a nice addition to have to my tools because we're essentially just putting our foot down on the accelerator when we plug this in and the power is flowing straight into the board. It's nice on these older boards to be able to ease that power supply up and just gently remind these old components what they're supposed to do. A bit like when I try to go out for a run these days and start by walking the first mile. With power now flowing around the board, the multimeter's back out to test that 5 volt circuit. Once again, as per the service manual, we're checking that 5 volts are going to pin 8 on the CPU, pin 28 on the ROM, pin 8 on each of the RAM modules, and pins 9, 43 and 48 on the ULA. We also tested that 18 volt output on the rear expansion port, and sure enough everything appears to be powered fine. So before we plug a display in, we'll do one more round of tests with an oscilloscope, and see if some of these chips are behaving as the manual describes they should. We'll start with our crystal oscillator, which should be giving us a 16 MHz signal. This of course is how the computer has a concept of time, and chips can therefore perform cycles. We should find the signal from the oscillator goes to the ULA. Such is the control the ULA has over the rest of the system. It takes this 16 MHz signal and then tells the CPU at what speed it can run at. This can be a stopped state, 2 or 1 MHz depending on the display mode that's in use at the time and the priority the ULA needs to have over the CPU in accessing the RAM something we discovered in the first episode of this series. Sure enough, our tests on the oscillator show that we have a 16 MHz output. A great start. By checking pin 49 on the ULA, we should see that same signal coming into the chip. And we do, so far so good. The ULA will then give out a 1 or a 2 MHz signal on pin 60 depending on the screen mode. and we're currently getting 2 MHz. Let's just touch on those screen modes because I think they warrant a closer look. There are 7 display modes on the Electron ranging from 0 to 6 with 0 at the highest resolution and 6 the lowest. You'll notice the higher resolution modes use as much as 20k of memory from an available 32k on the system. For this reason, most programs stuck to display modes which used only 10k or less of the system memory, leaving around 20k for the program itself. An eighth display mode, Mode 7, was surprisingly conspicuous in its absence. As Mode 7 was a display mode on the BBC Micro, on which this machine was based, and used less than 1k of RAM. It was used for many BBC Micro programs, as well as Teletext, the information service we used on our TV sets. The company Jaffa Systems provided a number of solutions to restore this mode, ranging from a ROM cartridge to hardware add-ons containing the same graphical chip as the BBC Micro itself. Once the machine's up and running, I'll demonstrate some of these modes to you so you can see the difference. So I finished up the checks with the scope, the CPU here showing 2 MHz currently.
and the ROM on pin 22 as well as the RAM modules on pins 4 and 15 are showing wobble. Not my words, the words described in the service manual. It says you should look for wobble on these pins and not one fixed level of logic. So with that final wobbly test, let's go ahead and plug a monitor in and see what it all amounts to. And would you look at that, it boots right up. Today's tale then is a cautionary one. When a machine has been in a loft, a shed or a basement for upwards of 30 years, it always pays to carry out a few pre-flight checks just to make sure you don't inadvertently damage the system or more importantly that you don't damage yourself or your home with dangerous or outdated power supplies. It's time now for me to get the marigolds on and get scrubbing so that we might restore this cosmetically to its former glory. I've also ordered a modern power supply and a set of new capacitors which will get changed in the next episode, in which we'll also be discussing and demonstrating add-ons for the system both old and new. As always, thanks for watching, give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs down if you didn't, and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more content like this. Take care cave dwellers.